Hello and welcome to The Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be returning to November 2010 and visiting Los Angeles, California. It was around 12.25am on Tuesday the 16th of November when residents in the upscale area of Beverly Hills were disturbed by the sound of four gunshots followed by the crash of a car. Multiple calls to the police followed and when officers arrived at the scene they found a 2010 black Mercedes-Benz E350 which had mounted the curb before crashing into and knocking down a street lamp. Behind the wheel of the car was a woman, smartly dressed in a dark blue dress and trousers. She was slumped over the inflated airbag, bleeding heavily, barely clinging to life. Medics worked to assist the woman, who was promptly transferred to Cedars-Sinai Medical Center, where, despite the doctor's best efforts, she was pronounced dead at 1.12 a.m. This began a murder inquiry which, whilst promptly officially solved, has left many with questions as to whether it has actually ever been fully resolved. The woman in the Mercedes was 64-year-old Veronica Chasen, better known as Ronnie. She was a well-known and well-respected publicist working in the film industry. Ronnie was born on the 17th of October 1946 in Kingston, New York, the second child of Carolyn and Irving Cohen. She grew up in Riverdale, the Bronx, and Washington Heights, Manhattan, with her older brother, Larry, who would later become a famous screenwriter, producer, and director. Ronnie moved to Los Angeles in the 1970s, initially to pursue a career in acting, but instead began working as a publicist. She headed the publicity department for American International Pictures before serving 10 years as the executive vice president of motion pictures at the prestigious public relations agency, Rogers and Cowan. Ronnie was appointed the senior vice president of publicity for MGM in 1993 and after that went on to set up her own company, Chasen and Co. Whilst relatively unknown to those outside of the industry, within Hollywood circles she was noted and respected for her publicity work for some of Hollywood's biggest stars and movie productions. She was a spokeswoman for top filmmakers, a key strategist for producers who were chasing an Oscar win, and was responsible for the publicity work of some of Hollywood's biggest stars, including Morgan Freeman, Michael Douglas and John Travolta as well as composers of film music such as Hans Zimmer. Ronnie worked extremely hard on behalf of her clients and expected those around her to do the same. She was tenacious and professional, developing long-lasting relationships with those she worked with. Ronnie was married briefly when she was in her 20s and chose not to have children, considering her friends and clients as her family. She worked on publicity and Oscar campaigns for more than a hundred movies including The Hurt Locker, Cocoon, On Golden Pond, Dream Girls, and Driving Miss Daisy. At the time of her death in 2010, she was working on the Oscar campaign for Alice in Wonderland, starring Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter. Over the years, her clients had netted over 150 Oscar nominations, with her music clients earning more than 65 Grammy nominations. On the evening of Monday the 15th of November 2010, Ronnie attended the premiere of Burlesque at Grauman's Chinese Theatre in Hollywood. Following the premiere, she attended the after party at the W Hollywood Hotel on Hollywood Boulevard. Ronnie left the party at around midnight to drive home to her condominium on Wilshire Boulevard. At 12.22am, Ronnie made a call from her mobile phone to the phone at her office in order to dictate a to-do list for the following day. This was not uncommon for Ronnie, who worked at all hours of the night and day. Approximately six minutes after making this call, she stopped at a red traffic light in the left turn lane at the junction of Sunset Boulevard and Whittier Drive in Beverly Hills. 
Whilst at this junction, Ronnie was shot four times through the front passenger side window of her Mercedes. The car drifted a short distance along Whittier Drive, less than a quarter of a mile, before mounting the curb and knocking down a street lamp in front of number 815. Residents reported hearing gunshots and the noise of the crash and an investigation by the Beverly Hills Police Department was soon underway. As news of Ronnie's murder was reported, there was shock among those who knew her and the local community, murders being extremely rare in this upmarket area of Los Angeles. The investigation initially concentrated on gathering forensic evidence from the scene and piecing together the order of events from the various 911 calls. There was no obvious motive or immediate suspects. The residents of the Whittier Drive neighbourhood were canvassed for CCTV footage and both the W Hotel and Ronnie's condominium were searched for clues. On the 20th of November, it was reported in the press that the mayor of Beverly Hills, Jimmy Del Shad, had said that the shots were fired from a higher position, indicating that the killer may have been in an SUV or truck. It was later clarified that this was the mayor's theory as opposed to the official position of the police department. That evening, details of Ronnie's murder were featured on the TV show America's Most Wanted. Her funeral was held the following day, on Sunday the 21st of November. The 250 seat chapel was full, with a further 300 guests seated under a canopy to watch the service on a screen and an overflow of guests who had to stand for the ceremony. Harold Matzner, on behalf of the Palm Springs Film Festival, announced that they were offering a $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Ronnie's murderer. Another friend of Ronnie's, Michael Levine, also offered a $25,000 reward. A week after the murder, the press reported that there were several clues which pointed to this being a professional killing. It was also reported that a friend of Ronnie claimed that Ronnie had spoken about being followed in March of that year and that she was afraid. Reportedly, the shots were fired quickly and evenly and newspapers began speculating about a hitman-style murder with carefully targeted shots. No shell casings, live rounds or murder weapon had been found. With little to go on, speculation became rife as to who was responsible for the murder. Was this road rage? A drive-by shooting? A robbery? Was she followed home from the movie premiere? Was it a professional hit? Or maybe a crime of passion? People were trying to make sense of this senseless act of violence. Rumours began to circulate about gambling debts, art deals and unscrupulous film finance. However, those who knew Ronnie denied this possibility. She was honest and straight talking, wasn't a drinker, never did drugs, and had clients with whom she developed such good relationships, she considered them family. Several days after America's Most Wanted aired, a tip was received from someone who believed that one of their neighbours may have been involved in the crime. This neighbour was 43-year-old Harold Martin Smith. Harold had various convictions dating back at least 25 years. He had completed two terms in state prison having last been released in 2007 following a robbery conviction and then discharged from parole in 2009. Harold had been living in the Harvey, a low-cost residential hotel on Santa Monica Boulevard in East Hollywood. He was unemployed, penniless and rode a bicycle. At around 5.30pm on December 1st 2010, the Beverly Hills Police approached Harold in the lobby of the Harvey to serve a search warrant. As they did so, Harold raised a gun and shot himself in the right temple, dying instantly. Those who knew Harold said that after two terms in state prison, he always vowed that he would die before going back again. Regardless of whether or not he had been involved in Ronnie's murder, an armed criminal being approached by the police would result in another prison term, something it would seem that Harold had no intention of doing. Some news reports stated that the witnesses had heard Harold boasting about killing Ronnie, while others claimed that he had said he had killed her for $10,000. The police declared that Harold was a person of interest in Ronnie's murder whilst awaiting further results. 
By the 6th of December, the press were reporting that the gun used in Harold's suicide was likely not the same weapon that had been used to kill Ronnie. The Daily News ran a story that residents in the location of Ronnie's murder had received an email detailing a man who had approached a woman at a stoplight, rolled down the window, smiled and pointed a gun at her before quickly driving off. The Daily News also stated that days after Ronnie's death, a 53-year-old man was shot through the passenger window of his car in Covina, California, in a similar attack. Thankfully, the man survived, although no official link was ever made between these cases. On the 8th of December, the Beverly Hills Police Department held a press conference stating that the gun Harold used to take his own life was a preliminary match to the one used to kill Ronnie. The police chief, David Snowden, stated that they had believed that Harold had killed Ronnie in an attempted robbery. They believed that Harold had acted alone and they did not believe that this was a professional hit and that they were not looking for anyone else in connection with Ronnie's murder. It was later reported that four shell casings were found during the search of Harold's belongings, although I've been unable to find any additional information about this. After three weeks of frenzied speculation about hired killers, gang initiations, gambling debts and the like, it seemed that Ronnie had simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time. However, many were left unconvinced by this conclusion. Newspapers were reporting that people were still questioning this official version of events, believing that there were too many unanswered questions and things simply did not add up. If this was a robbery, why had so many valuables been left in the car? Harold could simply have reached in through the shot out window and taken Ronnie's handbag and purse. Harold rode a bicycle and did not have access to a car. Was it a reasonable conclusion that this crime had been completed on a bicycle? There were no eyewitnesses or CCTV which put Harold at the scene, which led to many questioning how a poor black man carrying a gun could have gone unnoticed when cycling around affluent Beverly Hills. If it were true that Harold had been bragging about a $10,000 windfall, where was this money coming from if he was acting alone? With weeks of talk of military trained assassins, particularly in relation to the even spacing of the gunshots, could this murder really have been completed by this small time criminal on a bicycle who was desperate for money? Were shell casings found in Harold's possessions? The news reports had previously reported that the gun used in Harold's suicide wasn't a match to Ronnie's murder and many latched onto this apparently incorrect piece of reporting. However, those with doubts did not have a better theory of what had actually happened. The earlier rumours of gambling debts and the art world all turned out to be false. The valuables left at the scene could easily be explained. Ronnie's car had drifted for around a quarter of a mile after the shooting, which may have meant that Harold lost his opportunity to grab anything. Using a bicycle in a crime is far more common than most people think due to being easy to transport, the ability to quickly travel in narrow areas like alleyways and ease of disposal. Could it be that those who knew and loved Ronnie did not want to believe that she had been taken away from them in such a random and unfair way and because of this were seeking a better explanation for her death? In 2011, a news release was issued stating that after an exhaustive investigation, including a review of financial documents, thousands of emails and texts, as well as following up on many of the leads, the investigation had been completed. It was the conclusion of the homicide detectives that the sole perpetrator was Harold Martin Smith. In October that year, it was reported that Harold Matzner and Michael Levine, who had offered the reward money, were being sued by the person who provided the tip to America's Most Wanted because they had not paid the reward. Harold Matzner defended his position, stating that many people were disturbed about the case and do not believe that there was enough evidence to come to the conclusion that the killer had been identified. Whilst there was a suspect who had taken his own life, there had not been an arrest nor conviction of the person responsible. Harold Matzner went on to state that if the money did not go to the tipster, it would go to a good charitable cause. It was not about the money, he wanted justice for Ronnie. The lawsuit was eventually settled for an undisclosed amount. Many of the police reports and documents in relation to the case remained private, despite requests for these to be available. 
In California, autopsies are public record except when there is an active case or investigation. However, Ronnie's still remained private. This reluctance to share documents in a resolved case where both the victim and perpetrator are dead caused alarm bells with some people. The independent documentary maker, Ryan Katzenbach, entered a legal battle with the Beverly Hills Police Department and LA County Coroner's Office in 2013. This eventually resulted in some, but not all, of the documents related to the case being made available. During an interview with The Hollywood Reporter in 2016, it is clear that Ryan believes that there is more to be discovered about this case. The question remains that if this case had gone to trial, would it have been possible to convict Harold beyond a reasonable doubt? Sadly, to some, Harold's suicide was seen as an admission of his guilt. Ronnie's estate was worth around $6 million at the time of her death. After taxes, legal fees and charity donations were made, the remainder of her estate was left to her favourite niece, Larry Cohen's daughter, Melissa. Larry's other daughter, Jill Gatsby, was, in the words of the will, intentionally and with full knowledge of the consequences, bequeathed just $10. Jill stated that she loved her aunt, but there was a family secret regarding Ronnie and Jill's career as a writer, which Jill was choosing to keep to herself. Gail Reed sent me an email back in April suggesting that I should cover this case. Thanks for the suggestion, Gail. As usual, please remember to add any comments down below. I look forward to reading them. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye.